This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show. We're here at NAMM 2012 with James Lomenzo. I'm back. He's back. <laughs> Now, James, you know, we, we hunted you down here today. Eric, this is getting to be a habit. My wife is actually getting suspicious. Really? You know, I talked to your wife. She's a very nice person. Hey. Yes, no, she you know, is. You're very, you're very fortunate. I, I agree. I'm it's, blessed. It's hard to find a good woman in the rock and roll. But they say behind every good rock and roller is a good woman. And hey, uh, you know what? She's that's stalking what, me, actually. That's what makes you, that's what sets you aside, is because you have the intelligence to know that. <laughs> well, intelligence is, is probably not the best requirement for this sort of job, but thank you. <laughs> well, it must be, James, because you are involved with Aphex. Aphex. Now, tell me about Aphex, tell me about your involvement and what you've created for them. Okay, here's what's going on. Aphex has been around since the early 70s. Um, I remember reading in Cream Magazine, of all things, for all you oldsters out there like me, um, Cream Magazine uh, was discussing this new technology that was on all the recorded albums of the time, uh, albums by Paul McCartney, albums by James Taylor. I know it's all mellow stuff, but that's what was on the radio at the time. And they had this process by which they, um, they had this circuit that they would rent to producers to use to give a clearer fidelity. Kind of like when we talk out in the air, there's sibilance and all these sounds. They found this, this piece of gear that they created the that enhanced exciter. it, the oral exciter. It yeah. sounds sexual, but it's actually very good for the ears, oral, oral. And so, um, long story boring, um, they've been around forever. I caught up with a company um, when I was with Black Label Society because I was looking for a way to enhance the sound of my bass to cut through all his X million guitars. Yeah. And they had just made a pedal line that had the Aphex Oral Exciter with the big bottom, more sexual in your endo, and, um, and a great compressor, which is probably about as close to an LA to a, if you guys know what that is in the studio, that you can actually bring on stage with you. It's a really good compressor, very nice for bass. And so I got these two, two units I started using, so I started, I built an alliance with Aphex as, as a promoter and as an endorsee. Um, the company recently changed hands over the past year, two years, and I was fortunate enough to meet the uh, new president, David Wiener, and all his associates. And I said, hey, you know what? I really understand this gear. I would love to be involved as much as I possibly can. And so they basically invited me to be a, spokesman, a spokesperson talking head for their products. Well, what I do for Aphex these days is I have a company called Monster House. And we create um, tutorial videos and demonstration videos, much like you see throughout the whole NAMM show. Um, some of that stuff's going on on the screen right now. And uh, well, there you go. Well, that's me. There you are. Sometimes I'll even star at them. And so I make these videos so that, so we can promote um, the new equipment that they have, and that we can also have tutorials to teach people what they do. And they have great preamps and compressors and all this stuff that producers and musicians, home musicians like yourselves, guys that are creating stuff, can definitely use. And some of the stuff, price point wise, if I may use that word, mm -hmm. very unmetal word. But anyway, it's, it's really affordable and it really improved the sound of what you do. So I'm, I'm, I'm really into trying to promote this stuff. And that's what I'm doing here at the Aphex table today. Well, fantastic. And, and then for you, James, after years of being in the rock music business, what is important about the NAMM show? And what do you look forward to about the NAMM show? Um, I have to say there's, there's um, two things I look forward to. First of all, seeing friends I've made uh, over the years in, in a lot of the manufacturing sector. The guys who promote uh, the equipment that I use. Um, we have alliances, most musicians will tell you. You have alliances with these companies, amplifiers, guitars, and all that. And you can't help because these people, the people who work at the companies, they, they, they're always there to respond and help you get what you need to do your job. And that's a wonderful luxury to have, especially when you're traveling all the time and you can't really just run into a music store and grab something or the right thing. Anyway, so um, we, I've got so many friends out here that I get to catch up with this one time of the year. Um, it's also, the parties are great. I mean, afterward, performances are great. I get off on seeing the living legends. I get off on seeing, like, the, to me, it's like Lee Sklar walks around, or, you know, I see Billy Sheehan, although I see him at the shows a lot, but, you know, I get to run into these people. I see Stevie Wonder walking around, you know? Stuff like that is exciting to me as it is to most of the people who come to this thing. Now, James, uh, everybody knows that you, you know, you were in Pride and Glory, you were in Black Label. Everybody knows that. Well, you know what? <laughs> people should know that you were in Pride and Glory, that you you played with Black Label Society, of course, yes. and and we've talked about you know White Lion. We've talked about these other bands, but one of the bands I've never asked you about is playing with Slash. Oh, Slash! How many Snake. years? Yeah, Slash is Snake Pit. How many years did you perform with Slash? And tell me about that experience. Well, that was a two-year odyssey. Um, what happened with that was. Um 
Matt Sorum, uh, Slash had a band in 95 called the uh, Slash's Snake Pit, and Matt Sorum was the drummer and, and uh, Michael Inez was playing bass guitar, and I think they recorded most of the stuff on that record. Anyway, just as it was time to tour, we're getting into the summer touring season, um, Matt had gone off to do something else, as did Mike Inez went to go join Alice in Chains. So Brian Tishy got called in to, to replace Matt on the tour, and um, they needed a bass player right away, so Slash said, who do you got? And since the Pride and Glory band, which you brought up, um, I just finished playing with Brian, we became you know great friends in a good rhythm section, so Brian said, oh, you gotta call James. He lives here, you can come and rehearse, and I'm sure he'd wanna do it. And so that was it. So I, I kind of jumped in. We had about a week and a half to rehearse. Gilby Clark was playing guitar. I got, we were friends to this day, and you know, I got to meet him. And it was really exciting. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a thing about Slash is that he loves performing music. I mean, more, more so than you think. And a lot of people don't give him as much credit as they should for his ability, because I mean, he, he has a wide range of styles that he, he plays. I got to realize that later on. Anyway, we did the tour, we went through Europe, went through America, we did a, spent most of the year doing that. My daughter was born somewhere in the middle of all that, so that was kind of a challenging and exciting time all at the same time. And then we came back and we, we basically set up in a studio for about six months, better part of a year, and we had planned on making kind of this three-piece nucleus, Brian Tishy, myself, and, and Slash, and we put together a whole bunch of music, but something else came along and I think we all dissipated. Well, James Lomenzo, you are the man. Great seeing you, Eric. You too. Good blaring out with you again. Blaring out with Eric Blair with James Lomenzo at the NAMM Show 2012. Signing off. The Blaring Out Show.